Good morning. Welcome uh, to day two and the first early morning of uh, the Land Body Conference. I'm very pleased to welcome a group of people, um, all of whom will be introduced by someone you met very briefly yesterday, Meg Noden, who is the director of the Electa Quinney Institute here on campus. Electa Quinney, uh, the Electa Quinney Institute is a a uh, tremendous resource for Native students. It's also a pretty good resource for Native faculty. It's really the place on this campus where uh, issues having to do with Native Americans and Native American uh, education and language really converge. And Meg Noden has uh, been director for two years now, is that right? Really? Okay, so she's been she's, she's been running the world for a year and a half there. So, so I'd like uh, please join me in welcoming Meg and uh, and the other people she's going to bring up. Thank you. 
Men Prabhupada har sett mig och den är ett på den spänning är det att vi är så färdade och någon av oss. Vi kan ha rört ut och vart när ungdomar är bra på både navier och normer så är det någon gång i sig. Det är ett på skapen i sig. Jag har sett det samma som jag säger nu. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always amazing in terms of language programs when we actually have our first language elders who had for their entire life gotten a message, speak English, speak English, speak English. It's always hard to believe that you actually have a whole group of people that like, it's fine. They don't mind if they don't understand the language, you can hear it. So it's the real shift in your real pleasure. We could go, I would also just like to share sort of the diversity of people you see up here using this language, all of whom use it in one way or another in the way that they create knowledge or are finishing degree or moving forward in their careers. So if we go down the line, we could at least just sort of introduce ourselves and maybe just say in one line so people can see this is a pretty broad, broad range of teachers and students and people and teachers. Mm -hmm. um, you can um, and Brian Katrina, Hinoa, Diane, um, Hinoagi. Um, my name is Monet. I'm from Katrina, it's on the Menominee Reservation. And I'm a third in the middle school here. I'm like a college student. Mm -hmm. I'm a senior. I just got a McNair Scholarship to help <laughs> Here, I teach those who are here. My relatives are originally from Grand Portage and Montreal. So, it's all a great place. Can you come? Well, I will speak to all of you listening to us. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to sing on this. 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 Jag har varit redan om mina tidsfull länge. Vi kan ha det i andra stadien och vi kan ha det i andra stadien. 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 Min namn är Alfan Stefan, men jag är från Kanada. 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 And uh, I retired from General Motors after 32 years of service. And then Margaret <laughs> owned me one of the streets of the language. <laughs> <laughs> she thought I could speak the language, so. Uh, so I, they were asking me to start teaching the language or help out with it. So I thought, if I'm going to have anything to do with it, I better know. Uh, that would be going to school and learn how to teach this. Mm -hmm. So I spent four years working on it, and, I, and that included her classroom work. So that's where I got a lot of practice uh, to teach the language. So I'm still teaching it over there at the University of Michigan. So I also uh, do a language table. So well, I, I help anybody and everybody asking for help.
linguistics and anthropology classes, Bernie assigns her to watch what's going on in the class. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're setting the bar high for being informed uh, anthropologists. And <laughs> and linguists. Yes, you have to really yeah. learn it to engage. Yeah. 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 Bonjour, good check my Vincent Cod Muslim know them. Uh you blame how they know. Um, I'm Carrie Miller and uh, I'm uh, Director of American Indian Studies here at UWM. I work in uh, history and um, I've tried at various times to learn the language um, and I, I certainly do try to use to incorporate um, terminology. So we my uh, book is actually called Ogamog because Chief is not is a Western word. It's not descriptive of how we understand our leadership. So trying to bring the language back into scholarship in that way. Um, but there's there's one other thing I wanted to bring up while I have the floor. If, if Meg and Alphonse would elaborate on it a little more, I think our audience would be really interested to hear um, how Anishinaabe is more of a verb-based language. How emotion, uh, rather than objective, you know, is is the central. Um, the central um, tenet, the central thing, if that makes sense. It's true. <laughs> I think the other thing we learned, I have generations of students and we had years of working with students and I think we tried really to create an indigenous pedagogy. We and I are merging, trying to combine our curriculum that we do at the University of Michigan and that we use here in Milwaukee and very cognizant of our colleagues in Duluth and Bemidji and Trent and Ontario, it's a pretty broad area. And I think one of the things that they always try to do is teach from within the language. So teach people to build sentences and words, starting with the action. We have four types of verbs. How do we describe what's going on in front of us instead of moving across in a linear way and thinking in English first? So we're trying really hard to get across that when you learn each other, you actually learn a different epistemology. Do you guys have anything to add about that, given that Bernie sort of gave you some ideas and then you had to come up with the phrases, and you have learned by now <laughs> to start with the verbs. I don't know if you guys have anything to add. Or... We know we, for our final this semester, we have to create a prayer and we have to write it and in the language. And it was really hard to just say, I want to be brave because there's no like student brain action, but you need to be very specific at what you're doing and where you're saying. Mm -hmm. So that was really mm -hmm. difficult to get in like the English way of thinking because you think, hey, it's gonna just be brave, but when you're writing your English novel they sentence, you have to be very specific on what you're being brave doing. And I think really, I don't know, I mean, theory, I'll key something in for a grade, but the fact that your mother asked you to read the words <laughs> on Mother's Day, like that's the real yeah. grade. Yeah. <laughs> that the language gets out of the classroom in other spaces. So. Did you have anything to add about the bird cards? Or yeah, uh, like I was saying, the bird word, a mongook, is actually a bird. Mongokonense. Uh, it's a variation of how you say the word. Actually, you're describing what the star is doing up there. It is pointing. That's what that word says. So to come up with a different explanation, it doesn't work. <laughs> In English, it doesn't work. Uh, I've often debated that with other speakers. Uh, because they're believing what the English Saying, and I'm looking at the meaning of the word. I know it's a word, and therefore it's already telling me what it says. In the language. Now, you, uh, you translate it to equate what, what, uh, how you would explain it in English. And, and that's all you do. Not quite equal sometimes, but it touches on, on the meaning. And I think it's a difficult process of translation because so much of English is stationary objects. Mm -hmm. yes. And you're translating things that are in motion as something stationary that completely changes. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so when Gerald Zipper was talking about survivors, this is what he's talking about. It's in motion, and it's across these generations. And so the other important thing that I want to kind of share with all of you, too, uh, about this particular project, linking it back to Gerald Zipper, is the idea that survivors is not antagonistic. It is an invitation for all of us to participate in this process. Mm -hmm. That is why we are giving all of you these cards so you can participate in honoring our ancestors and giving back to the beautiful world. And so for me and uh, Meg, we decided that you know, it would be a great project, first of all, for the students to you know, use their creative skill to come up with a, a prayer uh, but second, to then extend the prayer uh, to all of you. And so over the course of the next couple of days, we will continue to collect all these cards. There are 12 in total, so you have to come to all these events. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason why this is important, and this goes back to indigeneity and its radical commitments. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in just a minute uh, is the idea that, well, survivors is great, but survivors also has to rely on what I would call resonance. The resonance of native voices in their native lands. And so here what we're talking about is all of you came here to this conference in the city of Milwaukee, in the state of Wisconsin. Both of those are Indian words. And it's unclear uh, what they actually mean. There are some estimates uh, in terms of translation, but one of the problems we have with this is that there is a particular kind of resonance, but that resonance is discord, it's dissonance. It's how the colonial settler society adopt these names without really understanding what they mean. What I would suggest is let's do away with the uh, dissonance and work on resonance. And so all of us together, they will be line for prayer for the next two days create that resonance in this native land. That's what this project about is about. It's a gift. It's an invitation. And so uh, I'll turn it back to you and And the other thing is maybe we could say we could end with this first word of the West Legon, which is if you look at it, we I grew up hearing this a very few words. Miigwetz is one we said all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes, we start. Gaggle, don't do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to 10, you know, you're basic. <coughs> and this is when you talk about like the radical commitments, the fact that we take back what that word really means. So Miigwe is to give. Miigwetz is really just a root verb. And they had to talk a lot about <coughs> when you do it this way, you're choosing to use a verb that signifies we all are thanking you, it's plural in this case, we all are thanking you as the kind of animist stars. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that resonate on a lot of these cards. I think the other thing is, <coughs> excuse me, we also see when we do these things, people learn the words and another them. So we could all say, to me that is for having done this, to the question, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. now you guys know how to say, if you are in a group and you encounter another group you want to thank, just deploy your, mm -hmm. your reactivated miigwetch, which has come back to life a bit from just being miigwetch to the miigwetch result. Mm -hmm. So I think that would take you. Maybe it's time. talking about is uh, experiencing uh, Native North America. It's the art installation piece that's out here in the lobby. Uh, one of the things that I would like you to do over the course of the next couple of days is walk in and out of that installation piece. And one of the things that uh, 
Um, <clears throat> this is a very long story, and I can only hint at how long it is, uh, because I can't tell you the whole story. Uh, but the genesis of this project uh, goes all the way back to my Haudenosaunee friends. Um, and um, <clears throat> it also goes back to uh, my conversations with Bill Visner back in the mid-90s. And so this project, one way to describe it in, let's say, colonial settler academic terms is to call it an art installation piece. Okay, so an art installation piece has particular kinds of semantic properties. It has qualities. It's a reference to a particular kind of object. Um, and so I can use that as a marker, but it's insufficient for what uh, designers do. The second thing is, well, I could call it, uh, an, I'm an anthropologist, and I'm required to produce texts. Okay, so I've got my monograph, I've got you know, book chapters, I've got articles, and as <laughs> Gerald Bruce said, those are dead voices, mm -hmm. dead voices. That's what they are. And so how do we rethink, especially if you're a linguistic anthropologist and you're working on language revitalization, how do you rethink that concept? And this is where, when uh, his novel came out, Dead Voices, back in the mid-90s, this is where I started to rethink this process of academia. Can there be something more that we could do? And so, yes, I produced the ethnography, I produced the text, uh, but working with language engagement, language extinction, and the kind of traumas that go with the loss of the language, it required more than just these tiny little motions on the keyboard. I had to use paint, I had to tear canvas, I had to put it all back together. And so for me, painting was one way of uh, producing another kind of ethnographic text. And so this is where, when you look at the piece, it's visceral. You don't have to turn it page by page by page by page. What happens is you look at the piece and you understand the emotive power that you know the, these kinds of works can bring. But I still was not satisfied with that. And so one of the things I decided to do was, well, how do you then challenge the kind of dominant discourses and perceptions of, uh, let's say, um, uh, academic pedagogy? So we can take American Indian classes, and we can take American history classes, but too often, both of them kind of ignore the significance of the other. And so indigeneity radical commitments, one of them is that we need to make sure that both of them are in conversation. Okay, so one of the things that I decided to do was how do I create the experience of being native in North America in a colonial occupied territory? where every single day you are reminded that this is occupied territory. You are reminded that nobody knows what Milwaukee means. Nobody knows what Wisconsin means. That's colonial occupied territory. And so for me, one of the things that we need to do is say, well, how do we, as Native peoples, maintain the integrity and the beauty of our languages and cultures against that kind of assault? And so what I decided to do was create that piece out there and say that you cannot ignore the relationship between the two. And so you can step on the inside, and the inside is a prayer. That is sacred space. Now, I'm not using sacred space in the Judeo-Christian sense where you just go one hour every week to give thanks to your, uh, <clears throat> let's say, uh, supreme being. Uh, no, I'm talking about an everyday sacred aspect where you do give thanks to the beautiful sunlight this morning. Woolly spots well? Say that. Woolly spots well? Woolly spots well. In Maliseet, that's good morning. Beautiful morning. Okay, so when you all said that, that's resonance. That's what this is about. How do we then take our languages and then bring them back into these landscapes? And it's not just for Native people, it's for all of us. That's the radical commitment that we all have to share in the process of bringing these back. And so when, once, we do, once I finish this project, 
then I introduced Nick to the project, and we decided that how do we take this beyond just academia? And this is sometimes the constraint we have is that, oh, well, you know, we're academics and nobody really listens to us. We have an opportunity to take our message beyond these walls. And so we were working uh, in concert with the Indian Community School. And if you go on the inside, you will see that prayer of thanksgiving. It started out as a Maliki prayer of thanksgiving, but you'll see four different languages. Menominee, Oneida, Anishinaabe, Nguyen, and Maliki. And so it became a community collaborative project. And the students were learning from that particular project, not just about the language landscape and spirituality, but they were also introduced to, to those particular colonial concepts, those particular kinds of processes that undermined their languages. So it was both a gift in terms of the kind of sacred aspect of their languages and their cultures, but it was also about recognizing the kinds of everyday assaults on their languages and cultures. It's something that they will never forget, but now they know how to deal with it. And so this is where the project uh, became something that, how do we take our knowledge from the university and contribute back to the community? And so I'd like uh, Meg and Terry to share, you know, how their own particular fields contributed to that particular knowledge. I'd like to jump in, that's fine. You can see how scripted it is. Yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> but we've actually presented it once before. So we've yeah, yeah. presented it a couple times. Yeah. Um, one of the concepts with which we presented it is um, here in Wisconsin, we have a, a law called Act 31. And it, it comes out of a, a particular historical moment in which we had significant conflicts over treaty rights uh, in this state that uh, became very uh, racially charged in terms of the kinds of protests, counter-protests, and, and anger that was directed at, at those expressing their treaty rights. And so as we finally resolved this uh, through the law, the law confirmed the treaty rights, um, we turned and said, the problem is our state citizens don't understand treaties. Our state citizens don't understand the historical context within which these were created. And so uh, in uh, 92, the state passed Act 31, which requires uh, the teaching of the history, cultures, um, sovereignty, and treaty rights of all Wisconsin tribes at the fourth, eighth, and eleventh grade level. So we've taken this installation piece uh, and uh, used it at uh, the Wisconsin Indian Education Conference at Pleasantown, and as well at the, uh, the ENSJ. Uh, which is a, a social justice network conference uh, for teachers that they have out of the Indian Community School in the spring. Um, and one of the things that, that really struck me um, about this piece is the way that it very um, visually demonstrates the experience of historical trauma. Um, you know, talking about historical trauma is you know, it's one of these things that's up here and, and a lot of people are like, well, what does that mean? And my students are always saying, why does any of this matter now? <laughs> and it's because as an Indian person, you are standing at the center of that piece and all four of those walls are pushing in on you every day, right? It's because we're still fighting court battles to maintain treaty rights. We're still fighting court battles to maintain sovereignty. Right? And, and even as I lecture to my students every year, I'm always pouring through, what's the Supreme Court working on right now? Um, so I can say, all right, here we're ending class in May. These are the arguments that came up, listen in June, after class is up. Find out what the next stage in all of this is. And that's present for us, very present for us. And so I, I've, I've always just so much appreciated um, this installation for expressing something that I try to teach about all the time, uh, but I think it uh, expresses it in a way that you get the immediate understanding simply by experience. So we created different curriculum pieces uh, for K-12 teachers, if anybody's interested in any of that, we have it. But we figure probably you guys are a little bit further along on your uh, theoretical interactions. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll let Meg uh, contribute 
um, a little bit more about the piece. Okay, and our goal is to actually just give you these brief introductions so that you can go out and walk through it yourself, right? So, um, I have to say, we're always so darn spontaneous here, and I look around this room and I see scholars who, whose books I have taught in class, whose words I have you know, recognized as resonant across our continent, and probably the most honest thing I could do is give you something very real not involving fishing in a river like Jerry, but you know. <laughs> but in that, in that way that um, we talk about difficult things. So it, in it, I have been reminded recently too that some people want to know before you're going to talk about difficult things so they can choose if they want to say, I don't want to hear about that difficult thing. So I completely respect if anybody says, if you're going to say something about suicide, I want to go and have a coffee. That is totally cool. Feel free to do that. Um, because I would have to say that I do multiple things. One is I direct an institute that researches Native education and I attempt to improve that education. And I try to make space to look at Anishinaabe aesthetics and to and literary ideas that I can't find in anywhere else but that language and increase my fluency so that I can practice creatively writing poems and moving our language forward. But it's so hard to do all of those things when I see children in the as well. And that's been something that we've had to deal with. Um, and like I said, I am not offended if anyone says, oh, I, I need to go elsewhere. But at first I felt like that's something we shouldn't talk about at a conference. We shouldn't, I shouldn't try to put those. Maybe I've got subtle references in a poem here or there or a song in my writing. But here's um, another story that I'm still working on telling that will weave into this, that when I get it down well, we'll put it in some essay and let it die, because that's what it needs to do. Um, this semester, I've had several really significant elders pass on. Basil Fox, you know, someone who I wrote my thesis on, um, who was very dear to me. Um, we had an elder that we know that was on our board that coordinates a conference, and we were planning to honor her. And she passed away before we could do that. Um, and Jim Northrup is someone who is so close to me and has been for a very long time. He is very ill. And I just got word he's back in the hospital this morning. You know, so that's this constant balance. But um, you know, even more significantly, we've had several unneeded suicides right in our community. So we have had these things, you know, this was the way that my month of the crust on the snow was going. You want the snow, but this melt is just creating a crust. And it was hard to move through that and think about what's going on. We had a murder-suicide situation that involved one of our students. We had a student who took his life, a student who was, had recently completed law school, who, you know, danced at powwows, strong native parents who loved him, and he knew that. Um, but the world was in the way. And three weeks after he did that, his sister did the same. And I went to uh, visit some friends in uh, Ann Arbor, and they were talking about health and well-being. A few work in Detroit and with a, another scholar at Michigan that studies native well-being. And this is a very short version, but sitting with a clinical therapist talking about what I see going on and saying things like, we need to recognize we're doing battle every day, mm -hmm. and we need to know that what our kids need is that balance. When I teach history, when you look at those outside of the boxes that Bernie has represented, that is painful and hard history. And when we brought it out to the school, it was so wonderful to be able to say, yes, this is colonization, but now step inside here, because this is what you have that you can access. And every day is a battle. And I think we do need to let them know that. Um, and there I was with this clinical therapist who has a license who, when you say those things, you lose all your civil rights. And six mm -hmm. cops and two cop cars and an ambulance showed up, and I was involuntarily admitted to the psych ward. This is like a crazy story, right? Mm -hmm. And sitting there for seven hours explaining to people, I'm not crazy. The world is crazy. You need to recognize that some of us see death so often that to talk about it is normal. And really, I have a strong network, and we're fine. And gradually, each social worker and up the ladder of seven hours of testing and whatever, they're like, oh, yeah, you're actually OK. 
you spared somebody, ultimately, is what the director of the clinic said. You spared the therapist. Okay. <laughs> you know? And while sitting in that waiting room, I thought, what do I do for several hours now while trying to explain to people that the world's a little crazy and that the kids who are taking their lives aren't wrong to tell us that. We need to stop blaming and trying to fix them and try to fix our world. And as I sat there with another young woman in that waiting room, I thought, well, what, you know, what do we do here? Here we are for two hours. Hi, what's your name? And I said, can you give me your turn, Trump off? Yeah, OK, I'll give it. <laughs> <laughs> so we get my turn, Trump off, you know? And then we're still sitting there, because we've had our clothes taken, our ID taken, our cell phones taken. We're sitting there. She says she is someone who has felt actually very close to taking her own life. And she's waiting for her parents to show up. And she wanted to be in that hospital. I said, I've got a dinner to make for my kids. I'm trying to get home. We're in different places. But you know, we're kind of in the same moment right now, aren't we? So want to learn a song? You know. So we sat there, and I thought, well, you know what we do? You know, we go for our words. We go for those things that describe what we do. And it's a song that was um, those songs that the women, when we tell the song, we always say this connects us across the Nishnabiyat team in Ontario. There were women who were put in Kingston prison, and there's a whole story that goes with that and why they were there. But when the song was given to me, I was told this is the song, the strong women's song, and they sang the song when they were put in solitary so that they would each know they were still okay. And the women would sing the song so that they could hear each other and get the spell and know that they were strong and that they were okay. And it was a song that had all these vocals. If you know, you know, there's a lot of songs that we had, out, especially out of our pan pan tribal movements that were great for civil rights um, that we've tried to like move a little notch better. So I sat there and I trot, trotted a, a strong one song. I'm, not, I'm, so, I'm sure they thought, oh, no, so I know about that. And they, still let, <laughs> they, they still let me out. I mean, because I think they recognized what I had done was something that taught them a need for cultural competency. And, um, you know, there's a lot of follow-ups and back and forth, you know, there's more to that story. But Ultimately, it was knowing that I had friends who did the same thing, who responded to the world by saying, no, it's not right for you to tell me to suppress what I see as reality, for you to say that we can't describe what we see in a very real way. And I do think that as we all look at the problem of native suicides and what's wrong with the kids, I don't know it's what's wrong with the kids. It's what's wrong with the world. How do we change that world so that they can live in it and be healthy, ask for the help that they need, identify when there's you know, issues of mental well-being and not feel they are being blamed and we have to find new families. So I think that this combination of recognizing Native history and balancing it with Native voice is sort of one of those new ceremonies that reminds us to sing, reminds us to move forward, reminds us to actually Try to shift the world a little, you know. So whether it's that you assign your tough documents written by your scholar friends <laughs> in your classes, which is great, um, or whether it's that you remind them to look at the land and look at the way the light shifts and look for the words that describe the So that would be kind of my contribution. Where when you see that, it is it is art, it's voice, it's representation. But I also think it's something that's very much alive, and it's what, what we need. When we put that thing out of the school, I can talk to kids about how to handle things that if they don't handle, it's starting to drop. So that's, that's my contribution. And so, so since you've gone there, I want to yeah. elaborate, if, if you don't mind. Um, one of the things that, that we've been asked to be aware of as well is that you're not all working in Native North America. Some of you are working in Indigenous and in other areas of the world. And when we talk about this issue of historical trauma and the issue of the high rates of suicide, those are characteristics of all of our indigenous communities across the world. Uh, just recently, NPR did a big piece on the rate of suicide in Greenland, which is still a colony of Denmark, right? Um, and, and looking at this worldwide. Uh, Canada recently had a, a huge crisis in Atawapiskat where they had 100 suicide attempts. So this is a larger issue that all of us as scholars of, of indigeneity um, 
you know, have, I think in some ways, a responsibility to at least be cognizant of, if not um, choosing as, as you might choose, um, to, to help be part of the solution. So that's my, that's my mission. We need all of you to make that radical commitment. All of you. It's not just our problem, it's our problem. I don't have a question. Oh, I, I want to add something. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to say to emphasize how Meg has so dramatically shown the tremendous overlap between feminism and post-colonialism. It's the same fundamental situation. If you were a man, you would not have been diagnosed as mentally unstable. <laughs> you would have been jailed <laughs> and maybe beaten, right? You could run for president. Yeah. <laughs> <There's laughs> <a> president. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really wanted to contribute, obviously I'm a generation older than Terry. And I was on the Wisconsin State Social Studies Advisory Committee for like 20 years in the late 70s through the 80s um, into the early 90s. This uh, no longer exists. This was the idea of Michael Hartunian, who was Social Studies Supervisor for Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Uh, when Mike became president of the National Council of the Social Studies, he no longer was able to convene this advisory committee of representatives from teacher colleges and the disciplines of social studies, and it disappeared. Um, but Alan Caldwell was the person who fought and fought and fought for that 1992 mandate from the state of Wisconsin that sovereignty, treaty, and basically, let's say, colonial conditions must be taught at three levels in the state of Wisconsin public schools. Mm -hmm. It was a long, hard battle. Uh, after that, Alan became the uh, principal of the Indian Community School here for some years. So I just think that we should honor Alan for his decades oh, of struggle and work. And, and he is, of course, he's the nominee. He's the nominee. He's the nominee, yeah. right, yeah. So I just wanted to add that. And I can't help putting one more little thing in. Historically, Carrie Jackson. <laughs> is remarkably like the beautifully, colorfully rotated silk robe that Jean Nicolet wore in order to convey the status that he had as envoy to foreign nations who had never met the French colonial government. And Nicolet came out in 1634, the first white man to land in Wisconsin. Uh, he was a, an envoy of Champlain, who was the governor of French Canada. And uh, it's quite a story. The, our local historian, Patrick Young, has uh, a manuscript that he is about to publish, I think, on this. Any rate, there's a famous story that Nicolet put on this Chinese silk robe because he thought he was in China. This is absolutely wrong. He knew damn well he was nowhere near China. He wore that robe because in the European courts, it was worn by diplomats to other courts to honor 
the ruler of the other nation by wearing this extravagantly luxurious and beautiful imported robe. So it looked very much like Harry's robe. Thank you. What it was, I, I, I bought this because it struck me as most similar it was to the uh, eating patterns of women in the community. Um, so that was, that was my reference. <laughs> So you see, indicative is not without its complexity. <laughs> As you drive across the country, my wife and I will be driving in one minute, I notice for a historical marker. And I said, oh, there's a historical marker there. And she says, well, do you want to stop and read it? And I said, no, I can predict what it's going to say. <laughs> Some white guy saw something here. <laughs> Okay, so what I would like you to do now with the remaining time we have left for this particular session, go out and enjoy that experience, experiencing Native North America.